Thanks so much, John, and thanks to all of you, and especially to our panelists who have come and collected uh, their ideas to present today about a very alarming subject. Americans are right to be alarmed about this fine on faith from the Obama administration. It's one of our first close-up looks about what Obamacare will look like in practice. There's been plenty of coverage of this controversy, but we've also seen a willful neglect of the many women's voices that are speaking out in opposition to this mandate. We've also seen a willful neglect of the core issue at stake. That issue is liberty, and most immediately, religious liberty. Today, a few of these very women will speak for themselves about our first freedom and why it is so important to our welfare and the welfare of this great nation. We need to be clear at the outset about a few facts. First, with this mandate, the Obama administration has attacked religious freedom and it has not compromised. Despite talk of so-called accommodation, the final anti-conscience mandate was published in the Federal Register on February 15th with no change, absolutely no change, from the original version that even liberal columnist E.J. Dion termed a breach of faith. Well, the mandate has not changed since that was written. As a result of this final rule, religious employers like Catholic hospitals, Christian schools, and faith-based soup kitchens will be forced to provide and pay for health insurance coverage of abortion-inducing drugs like the morning-after pill and the week-after drug, Ella, along with contraception and sterilization, even if these conflict with their religious beliefs. Well, today, several of our panelists represent the religious viewpoints that will be trampled by this mandate. But I want everyone listening to this program and watching this program to take this very seriously. All Americans whose own religious beliefs or moral values inform their own health care decisions should be very concerned. Why do I say that? Because under Obamacare, government mandates what insurance plans must cover, what employers must offer, and what individuals must buy. There is no way out of Obamacare. This anti-conscience mandate is only the beginning of Obamacare's mandates. It's an ominous sign of what's to come once the 2,000-page law is fully implemented. What will Obamacare require on other matters of deeply personal religious belief and moral significance when it comes to prenatal care, adolescent health decisions that should be governed by parents' uh, moral authority, uh, end-of-life issues, any number of things that will be of moral concern to many, many Americans? Obamacare has handed the moral compass to bureaucrats for our most personal health decisions. The women on the panel here today share these concerns and want to alert other Americans as, to them as well. Let me introduce them now. Maggie Carner serves as director of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Life and Health Ministries. Mrs. Carner sits on the board of the National Pro-Life Religious Council here in Washington, D.C., and she also oversees more than 400 parish nurses in her denomination across the country. She's married to a Lutheran pastor and is the mother of three daughters. Welcome, Maggie. Dr. Pia DiSolani is an ethicist and cultural analyst. She runs her own consulting company, Ditema Consulting, and she focuses on women's health, life issues, the new, femi new feminism, Catholicism, and culture. Dr. DiSolani is, uh, received her doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. Thanks for making the trip across the country today. Lori Windham is senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, where she worked with the Harvard Law Legal Aid Bureau and interned with the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department. Uh, Beckett Fund is doing extremely important work representing clients on this matter, and she'll share more about that with us. Hadley Heath is a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, specializing in health care, entitlements, economics, and fiscal policy. She's a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and also studied economic development and globalization in Santiago, Chile. We're very glad to have here, her here today to broaden this discussion to how it fits into the overall assault on liberty that we see in Obamacare. And Kate O'Byrne is the president of National Review Institute, which is a nonprofit public policy organization founded by Bill Buckley in 1991. 
Before joining the Institute, she was the National Review Magazine's Washington editor, and before that was a colleague of ours here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I want to thank Kate and the National Review Institute for co-hosting this event with us here today. Kate will be introducing Congresswoman Anne-Marie Burkle, who will be arriving shortly, and, uh, and then we'll move into Q&A with all of you, whom we thank for being here today. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Maggie. Each of our panelists will speak for about five minutes, and then Kate will introduce the Congresswoman. So Maggie, please join me in welcoming being Maggie Carter. Thanks for having me here today. Um, so, where are the women? Here we are. We're all here today. Obviously, we can get a group of women together to talk about something that, well, really isn't just about women at all. We're here to oppose the government's attempt to, to mandate our choices, to control our choices, especially those of the most personal kind, those that violate our consciences. We're here to advocate for basic religious freedom. And I don't really give a rip what gender is speaking about religious freedom as long as somebody is talking about it. This is about all of us, women and men, American citizens, and our constitutional rights. I'm a Lutheran and I work for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and I'm here to say that this is not just a Roman Catholic issue. It's not an issue about birth control and it's not just an issue about women. Quite frankly, when I see it represented that way in the media, I know that the reporter hasn't done his homework. You see, German immigrants in this country back in the 1850s looking for a place where they were free to exercise their religious rights. They were the founders of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and that unique community of believers grew and quickly built schools and churches and hospitals and orphanages all across the nation. And over the past century and a half, we've grown into a national church body of about 2.3 2 million members and about 6,200 congregations spread out all across the United States. We now operate 2,300 schools and early childhood, center, early childhood centers, 10 universities, and we're not just active in this country either. Those early founders have made a difference across the world. We care for the unmet needs of thousands of people in third world countries. We've donated over a million dollars in needed pharmaceutical drugs in our medical and relief efforts overseas in just the last few years. We do much for this country, and we do much for the world. You see, that's because, along with the whole Christian church on earth, we believe in our responsibility to bring care and healing to a broken society, to both body and soul. And we have a fancy theological name for that. It's from the ancient Greek, and it's called diakonia. But it simply means service. It's not charity. We call it mercy. And mercy is intrinsic to every Christian's life. It's not what we do, it's who we are. It's our identity, it's the mark of the church. And here's the key thing. There are no adequate conscience protections in this mandate for mercy in society given by the church. It effectively levies a fine on our faith. For religious people, mercy is not confined just to our houses of worship. It's not about caring for ourselves. It's about caring for others, those outside the walls of the sanctuary and in the most needful places of our society. It's just as an example, there's thousands of faith-based nonprofit hospitals all across our nation that grew out of this legacy. And historically, these religious people shaped the very fabric of what our modern American compassionate healthcare delivery system looks like today. That's where we got it. So here's the point. Religious folks have some street cred to bring to the table when we're talking about public health and the good of our society. Faith-based organizations, no matter what the denomination or the creed, have a long history and a vested interest in our society and we have much to contribute in the future. We can be a valuable asset to the government as we help to address all the needs in our society, but we can only do so if we're given the freedom to work within the framework of our beliefs. This anti-conscience mandate, it doesn't allow that. It strips us of the protection of our First Amendment rights. Remember, this debate is not about contraception. Nobody's advocating for denial of access. Nobody's threatening women's health. Nobody's outlawing anything for the general population. 
This debate is simply about us being forced to pay for products and services contrary to our religious beliefs. We can't be expected to check our faith at the door. And quite frankly, the anti-conscience mandate says a lot about the trajectory of movement on future issues of religious freedom and our ability to engage our faith within society. We're afraid that this current mandate is just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to lead the way to more and more government intrusion into our freedom of conscience. Religious people believe that our bodies are the temples of the Lord. We were created in his image. And that means that there's spiritual and theological considerations that come into play when we make our health care choices. This mandate has effectively opened up Pandora's box and introduced forced compliance with government regulations that are way outside the bounds of the First Amendment. This time, it's about contraception. But what will it be next time? Government intrusion into end-of-life decisions, as Jennifer said, parental authority for minors' health decisions. The list can be ominous, and simply put, the government should not be telling the church what its morals and practices ought to be. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is opposed to this mandate because it runs counter to the biblical truth of the sanctity of all human life. We're committed to ensuring that we remain free to practice the teachings of our faith and that our religious rights are not violated. We want to continue to respond to Christ's call to care for our neighbor, wherever that may be, in the pew or in the streets. But to do that, the federal government must remove itself from and stay out of our consciences. Thank you.